Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger. We're missing Brian Broom this time. Uh, But we are about to be introduced, you and I, listener, to the work of Harvey Cox. Harvey Cox. Did I get his name? You got it right. Oh, how shameful (laughs) it comes down to that. (laughs) You mean Socrates, Plato? <laughs> so, <great>. uh, <laughs> so this is a way to segue out of some current elements in uh, pagan humanistic thought back to our overarching theme, the city of God. But Harvey Cox wrote a book in 1966 called The Secular City. Emily was asking me, who's Harvey Cox? He's the guy who wrote The Secular City in 1966. <laughs> he went on to Apparently write a few other Apparently very things. popular then and was, not much remembered today. <laughs> it was very popular at the time and the Times bestseller list noticed him and it got him a job at Harvard as a professor. He retired in um, 2009, I think I just saw on hmm. Google. Uh, and he, tend, he had a habit of jumping from one philosophical fad to another. He wrote The Secular City and within a couple of years he was running in a very different direction. The thing about this book, I've, I've seen it referenced in, in other people writing on sociology and philosophy and epistemology. So somewhere along the line, I must have seen it at a used bookstore and picked it up. And it's pretty well written, actually. And as I read the early chapters on the origin of, of the city, as opposed to the tribe and the town, uh, I recognized the people he was quoting as people I otherwise respected. So... <laughs> Uh, and he did a good Seems job. Seems like Fustel de Coulange would come in here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's, he, okay. that's one of the people he quotes. Mm-hmm. And he uh, he builds this argument that man began uh, presumably at some point in his evolution, and in terms of family and then tribe, which is extended family, and the, the jump from there to the town or the village is the next big step from superstition to formal religion, and that we eventually go to the city, and the city shakes things up, that shift shakes things up again. And beyond that is the rule of technocracy, or tech, what he calls uh, technopolis, hmm. uh, a, a city in which we, in, uh, technology is so integrated into, into the way we live and think and act and, and react that it it has to be a dominant factor in what we're doing, and in which religion and metaphysics and philosophy of all sorts, Christianity, yes, but all the others too, slide into the background, sort of like the cocoon falling away, because this is what history is all about. How does and he it, define technology, or how would you infer his I don't, definition? I actually do not remember him giving a definition, but that may be the lack of um, my memory. Since he wrote in 66... Let's see. No internet, no Mm -hmm. um, home computers, uh, no cell phones. In some ways, he was a prophet, I suppose. He saw where this could go. And of course, there were a great many science fiction writers at the time. And Mm -hmm. I mean, classic classic science fiction, not the Star Wars type, but, you know, people who looked at the real possibilities of technology and said, well, if we extrapolate in the future, this is what could happen. So, in the sense of saying, this is, these are possibilities when we become. We're not, we're not only able to use nature, but we become integrated with it through our extensive technology. Okay, he's, he was on to something. Uh, but so t- science and tools together as a concept. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And that this will frame the modern community of man. In, to meet such challenges, he argues, I guess is the word, that men need to give up the religious taboos of the past, just as they gave up their primitive superstitions, and recognize that there are no divine voices from Sinai or Mecca or anywhere else, that man's on his own, that the the removal of the supernatural leaves only the natural, leaves man in charge, and man has got to decide, or men collectively have got to decide what they're going to do about that. Uh, hiding behind religion isn't going to work anymore. Uh, but if we want a happy world, then we have to learn to live together somehow and use this technology for the benefit of the planet. A little bit of, of green speak going on there, but most of it is, is still very man-centered. Uh, we, we, we need to 
live together and just get along. And that's going to require us to make some hard choices and to make up some rules. He has the wisdom not to tell us what the rules are. <clears throat> because first of all, I mean, the whole thesis is this has to be something that every person, every nation, every country, every region, every continent has to have a voice in because we're moving toward a, glo a global community. And mm -hmm. so, no one person can make up the rules. It, we all have to come up with some kind of system, probably a flexible and expanding one that will take into account the needs for today and tomorrow and next century and next millennium. And Christianity, he argues, is the, the womb, the cocoon out of which all this grows for a couple of reasons. And let me let me lay these out, <clears throat> and, and and we can see how close he gets. He he actually almost gets it, and then <laughs> takes a dog leg to the right so sharp, or to the left in this case, that it's you can't believe it just happened. So first of all, he looks at the the Hebrew doctrine of creation, and and comes up with the the proper interpretation: God made the world. God is not the world. The world is not God. There is a sharp distinction here that cannot be crossed. This was, and that the Hebrews were unique in believing this. Mm. Uh, he uh, probably had read the ancient city by. You can tell me. You can pronounce the name for the author for me again. Fustel de Coulanges. Coulanges. Okay, uh, because that's very much Coulanges' uh, approach toward the. Well, yes, he, he even. Quotes good launch points. Uh, the, every city, every ancient city was a religious institution. The gods indwelt, not simply in the sense of acknowledging a religion, but the gods actually lived in the cities. The cities were constructed by magic in terms of the central altar fire, which was a testimony to uh, a deified dead ancestor. Harvey Cox yeah. gets that. The, that. the ancient city, for our listeners, the ancient city is the book by Fustel de Coulanges that right. is the definitive work on the worldview of the ancient pagans. Mm -hmm. And so Cox has read that and he gets yeah. and he, he does a good job of setting it forward. Uh, there's a um, another book whose title I don't remember and I don't think I quote in my article, um, but it's uh, on philosophy before Socrates. And it discusses the worldview of... Uh, Mesopotamia, Syria, Babylon, and, mm. and, and Sumer. And it, it's very much in line with all of this, in that it, it, it shows the classical world thought one way. Then there were the Hebrews. <laughs> Those Hebrews were funny people. They did not think that God was immersed in nature. They absolutely stood by that, and their whole worldview came out of that. Right, good. I wish Christians <laughs> understood that better. Yeah. So on on this first doctrine, Harvey Cox, whether he believes in the biblical doctrine of creation, he doesn't actually say. He understands the implications of people of, of the doctrine that people have professed and have believed. God's not creation. Creation's not God. God does not incarnate himself in a political order or in an um, ethnic group or in some magically constructed institution. God is God, and the world bows before him, and all men of all sorts owe him allegiance, and his his will is revealed in his word, the biblical doctrine of creation. Cox argues that as that became disseminated in the ancient world through the Christian gospel, the spread of Christianity, people began looking twice at their social institutions, their conceptions of government, society, of the empire and the emperor, and began to wonder, hmm, what if that, what if all that's not divine? What if that's what if God is in his heaven and Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father and we're like, you know, human, just mm -hmm. men, but charged to be stewards of this creation, which is God's territory and God's property? That's a fantastically different worldview than saying that we're all God and we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. The ant There's is a divine God. spark in each of us. Yeah. And in the ant and in the possum and in the skunk mm -hmm. and in the, you know, palm tree and whatever. Second, he turns to the Exodus and, again, is able at least to read what the text says, whether he believes it or not, I cannot say. But it sh the, the book of Exodus in showing us that incredible movement of God to rescue his people from bondage, uh, it shows us God completely overturning the worldview of Egypt, the, the bureaucracy, the, the magic, 
the political empire, which were all in, which were all tangled up together. You can't come to Egypt and say, "Well, here was their politics, but the religion was over here, and the and the way they implemented things was it, it's it was all compact into one system." It was the most powerful mm -hmm. thing on the planet at the time, and God just took his finger and flicked it, and it went down, mm -hmm. and never recovered really. Uh, so Cox looks at this and says, "Well, see, this is what God and and." Hebrew thought and Christianity eventually does to the realm of the political. It desacralizes or desacralizes the political. So you can look at the political and no longer say, wow, that's those are the gods. That's the that's divine. Uh, it turns out that the emperor is just a man like me and he puts on his pants one leg at a time, you know? It's he's just this guy. <laughs> um yeah. which was a huge thought. Mm -hmm. And and again, he's he's right. This is what was. This is part, at least, of what was going on. It's not the whole story by any means. God had bigger things in mind than simply doing that, but He did that along the way. The Book of Exodus is full of, and the Psalms are full of notes that God brought judgment on the gods of Egypt. It was not simply an economic thing. It, it was political. It was religious. It was all wrapped up together. Mm -hmm. And even and, throughout Scripture, you have the use of the word gods as meaning human authorities. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, the Exodus did take all that apart. And what follows, of course, is Mount Sinai and um, revealed laws that come directly from God that human judges are to implement. And God does, as you say, at that point, call the judges gods, God with a little g, because they're they work for God. They're exercising mm -hmm. divine authority in part and in pieces and a very local restricted assignment. But it is God's authority. It's not made up. It's not man's. It's not the vote of the of the group. This is not democracy. This is not Roman republicanism. This is theocracy in the sense that God wrote the rules and we are to enforce them. Now we have to enforce them with wisdom because he didn't provide us with a you know, 12,000 long page book that covers every single possible example. He expects us to reason from general principle through case law and uh, biblical story to practical application. And again, that requires a man to walk with God and to know his word thoroughly so you can start making connections. Okay, he did. And the, that was the requirement, the qualification yeah. for those judges it was not, yes. you know, they're, they've lived so long in Israel. No, they had to know the law of God. They had to be wise, and they had mm -hmm. to have the character of despising bribes. Mm -hmm. And so they were supposed to be able to look at a situation where, I don't know, I, I just read um, this on LinkedIn uh, on one of those things that flashes up that tells you what uh, our first responders and our law enforcement uh, people are doing. Uh, a boy was uh, constantly being caught breaking into a gym to exercise at night. <laughs> and they kept telling him, stop it, or we're calling the police. He kept, but no matter what they did, he kept finding new ways into the gym, apparently. And finally, they just called the police and said, this, this has got to stop. And the cop talked to the guy, and the young man said, look, I just want to exercise. I had a membership here, but then, you know, things happened to the family, and we didn't have any money, and I can't afford it, and all I want to do is exercise. Now, we could say, thou shalt not steal. You're going to make restitution. You've crossed boundary lines in American law. That may mean some jail time. There's a lot of ways you could go with a very legalistic, literal handling of this case. Mm -hmm. What the cop did instead was say, okay, I'm going to buy you two months membership. What? <laughs> <laughs> and the owner said, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm paying for it. Here's the money. Sign him up. The word got back to corporate and they were so impressed. They said, yeah, we'll take that. We'll parlay that into two-year membership. <laughs> Now, do you think that helped the community more than slapping the guy in the wrist, giving him a few days community service and slapping some fine on him? Probably, and he's probably going to be a better asset to the community, he probably is not going to come back and, oh, I don't know, spray paint the walls, the outer walls of this uh, gym out of frustration. It was an elegant solution. It cost the cop a bit of money, to be sure. Uh but there, there's a practical application of what the difference between here's the here's the law, here's the offense, here's the penalty, and what does wisdom require? What's the goal here? What does what does God want in this situation? How can I make that happen with the least must and fuss in a way that everybody's going to be blessed by this? 
that's why it takes you know a machine can't be a judge this is why this <laughs> is why artificial intelligence can't handle it it takes the human touch and so judges are called gods elohim in scripture now harvey cox as he comes to sinai realizes some of this he realizes that this is yahweh the creator speaking from outside of time and history uh, into history and laying down a law, and he looks particularly at the second commandment and realizes that the second commandment and saying, don't make any visualization of God, is in fact saying, don't try to create your own value systems. And I don't remember if he, if he says this himself or if he's quoting somebody else, but he says, because the ancients understood that every idol was in essence a value system. Wow. You had a, you what had is enough. it? What is it with like these people who are not even Christians who <laughs> understand the second commandment? Yeah, so well? I know. Like this guy and Neil Postman. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, she's referencing Neil Postman in Amusing Ourselves to Amusing death. Ourselves to Death. Where, but Neil Postman did consider himself a Christian of some sort. Of oh, of, I thought he was a secular Jew. I, um, I must be mistaken. No, I don't believe so. I believe he, oh. he, at least at one point, he was working for the National Council of Churches. I so stand corrected. He, well, we could we can look. And see. <laughs> we can look it up. <laughs> we can look and see. Um, but uh, because he does make some, I, mean, he, I may have misinterpreted a remark because he does remember the second commandment from his youth. That could be Jewish, but he gets it. He understood that even with his his secular leanings, he understood that the second commandment meant that some things are, some things cannot be communicated through visual images. And that among these are religious absolutes and religious values, and ultimately God himself, who is truth. You can't reduce God to a picture. Uh, and that's something of what uh, Harvey Cox is getting here. You can't, you can't bring God down into concrete images. Now, as Christians, we would say, yeah, now look back at the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's a first commandment. It says, I'm God. Here's my law. So in saying no made up religions, no man-made value systems, he's sweeping them away to make room for his value system, for his law. Harvey kind of misses that. And says, see, this just demolishes all religious value systems, all metaphysical systems, all philosophical systems, all isms, and it leaves, and ultimately it leads to the point where we don't need systems of thought. We just got to be us and make hard choices in the face of life's challenges. And Christianity set us up for that. It's brought us this far. We now have, need to have the guts to push through to the next level Leave behind anything that is merely superstition or that is merely a, a system of thought or an ism uh, for the sake of the city of man. And that's how he brings in the city of man. The city of God, such as it was, the Hebrew people in the church, existed to bring forth this new human community that will operate in terms of human rules and values that we will make up to meet our needs as we go along, apparently. Because again, you can't know the future and you can't legislate for all time. The Romantics at least understood that. So it has to flow out of all of our hearts together in any given moment. He says more in the book, but I think you get the point. Here is a, a line from Harvey Cox. It's only looks like 30 pages in, but it sums up his thought to that point. All idols and icons must be exposed for the relative conditional things they are. Tribal naivety must be laid to rest everywhere, and everyone must be made a citizen of the land of broken symbols. Well, the language is powerful. He understands rhetoric mm -hmm. well. Broken symbols, so reminiscent of T.S. Eliot. Mm -hmm. he, he's using images to call down, the, to call for the destruction of images. Uh, intellectual images, philosophical images, systems, ways of, of looking at the, at, the, at the world. Once everyone, and this is what I wrote in response, once everyone abandons his imagined absolute, once every society and culture admits that their values are relative, then the whole world can work at creating a pragmatic value system 
that can benefit everyone. Harvey Cox says, secularization places the responsibility for the forging of human value, values, like the fashioning of political systems, in man's own hands. So this is taking us back to the garden and saying yeah. we will determine good and evil. We will know for ourselves what is good and evil because yeah. we can't count on God. God, his idea of God's transcendence apparently kicked God out of the universe at some point. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming he believes in a God of some sort, although I wouldn't swear to it. He he was ordained as a, a, a pastor in a liberal Baptist denomination. He wrote this originally for a group of Protestant students who were studying issues related to this. He adopts a religious position, but here he becomes a prophet of the end of all systems of religion, Christian or otherwise, and points us to what lies beyond. Well, so much for using Harvey Cox as a springboard. We, we've talked a great deal in the past about the ancient concept of the city of man as, in fact, a city of the gods. And men and gods live together in the same community, and every city is a city of God or of the gods. It's divine. And by living there, you're divine. And anyone who tells you you're not is the enemy and probably needs to be killed in some fashion. But of course, every city had its own gods. Alexander complicated things by conquering half the world, and <laughs> then they had to decide, wait, now now who makes the rules? We, we have so many gods that we've conquered. Who's who's the boss? And the, the fascination with keeping around the gods that you've conquered yeah. <laughs> is amusing. <laughs> no, it's like serial killers keeping trophies. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, R.J. Rush Jr. writes this about Christianity. By D divinizing the world. Christianity placed all created orders, including church and state alike, under God. By denying divinity to all and by reserving divinity to the triune God, all created orders were freed from one another, made independent of each other, and together, and this is important, together independent, interdependent in their dependence on God. Church and state, state were alike required to be Christian, but neither one was able to be a total Christian order. And so going back to the creator-creation distinction, which was affirmed so powerfully at the Council of Chalcedon by saying that even in Jesus Christ, the human and the divine do not mix, Christianity was saying, God's God, Jesus is God, you're not, we're not, nothing <laughs> on this planet is God, which means uh, you're not the boss of me, you're not, you're not God, I don't have to bow down and cower before you. I can tell you mm -hmm. no, and hold up a Bible and say, thus saith the Lord. Western liberty is implicit in these doctrines. Mm -hmm. And uh, Would you tell, sorry, can I interrupt and yeah. ask you to tell the story of the students that you overheard cheating on a systematics <laughs> test? <laughs> yeah, one of them, uh, at least for a while, was, uh, he grew up to become a pastor and was, uh, president of our synod. But <laughs> right. when he was up, <laughs> my first year teaching, he was, uh, he was my student. And we were, I was teaching theology. I was using Dr. Bereshini's book, uh, Foundations of Social Order, which is a book on the creeds and councils of the early church and their social and political implications. And I'd given them a test, probably on Chalcedon, the Council of Chalcedon. And uh, I was walking around the tables as they were filling out the tests, and I heard one young man speak to this this uh, future pastor and say, what, what did you put on this? He looks over and says, the state becoming God? Is that the answer? My student said, well, it's the answer to everything else in this class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe. Having taken that <laughs> class, yes. Yes, <laughs> Accurate. <all right. laughs> the state cannot become God. Just remember not, that. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Well, you know, it's an issue today. Yeah. Romans 13. Does that mean that we have to obey the state totally under all circumstances, no whatever what it, it no matter what it tells us? Well, most people are most Christians, I think, get the idea. Well, if it commands you to worship idols, then you should say no. But short of that, and I, my wife and I were just having a conversation about this with regard to our own school. At what point do we tell the state no? Mm -hmm. um, 
Obviously, if they come in and say, bow down before this idol, we would hope that everyone would refuse. What if they say, well, you must teach evolution because science says it's true? We would also say no. But science, but the state, but no, you're asking us to teach lies. How about if they tell us we have to hire a drag queen to come in and entertain our kindergartners? We're going to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and so it goes. And so some Christians haven't thought this through far enough. And I won't go to all the places that are really touchy right now, but think about mm -hmm. it for a while. What else has the state been telling us we have to do because science says so? Well, you're going to disobey in these other places. How about these touchy ones? Where do we decide? Where does it end? Where does the where does the rest of Scripture balance out a superficial reading of Romans thirteen and tell us mm -hmm. the state is the servant, the deacon of God? That means we're supposed to expect it to obey God and do God's stuff when it is in flat out rebellion and trying to subdue us and tyrannize over us, especially in America where the state is not the final authority. It. The Constitution may not formally recognize God, at least recognizes we the people. Um, <laughs> and the, is, uh, the Constitution doesn't recognize the people who are currently in power as the supreme law of the land. The no, Constitution it, <laughs> recognizes itself. Itself, <laughs> yeah. And, and beyond that, the people who created mm -hmm. it. So th there's, there's some fundamental misunderstanding. We don't live in the Roman Empire where Caesar is perceived as God and mm -hmm. where any motion against him... Uh, must automatically provoke condemnation on, and, and probably persecution. We live in a nation that was founded upon the idea that there are transcendent laws that the people in power right now actually have to obey and should be called on account if they don't obey. And that means that someplace resistance has to begin. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be vicious and mean, and it doesn't mean we grab guns and go out and assassinate people. And it, it might look up different for people in different roles. Yeah. Different times, different places, different condi conditions. Uh, we were just um, in staff devotions this morning. We were just reading Samuel with the foxes. You remember the foxes? The foxes? Yeah. I remember S Samson. Samson. collecting. Oh, I thought you said Samuel. Samson sorry, with the foxes. Yes. Samson with the foxes, yeah. And he, he collects them and ties them tail to tail and gets 150 teams of... Uh, foxes or jackals and sticks torches between them and throws them into the how standing How does he ray. do that? Like I've tried to <laughs> bathe a cat and I'm not sure how he managed to tie foxes tails together. He can tear a lion in half. I think he can manage this. I just, that's a question every kid yeah. asks. <laughs> in fact, my wife just thought through this and that was her first question. How did he catch them together? <laughs> Super glue. I don't duct tape. <laughs> duct tape, no doubt. I don't. It doesn't mean he actually had to take the tails and intertwine them. It just means somehow he tied them together. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe he did. Maybe he broke a lot of fox tails oh, in, in the process. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Wrap them the in towels. point in all of this is you could look at that and say, um, he's a terrorist. And then when uh, the odds get upped, the, the Philistines find out why he did this. It's because. Uh, his father-in-law had given his wife away to someone else, believing, probably truly believing, that Samson had abandoned her, and this was this was Samson's revenge. The Philistines took away his seed; he's taking away their seed. Play on words, puns, and all that. Well, when the Philistines find this out, they then burn down the house of Samson's father-in-law and his wife and kill them. And Samson basically says, "That's not you to do. You just killed my family." Now, as a judge, I will mete out due vengeance, and he hmm. takes out a whole lot of them. Um, and he, and he, as Christians, looking through the eyes of Roman thirteen, we could say he's a social revolutionary. This is this is this is just wrong. He's out of control. No, this is a time of war. Judah is occupied. Samson just offered them a peace treaty by offering to marry one of their girls, and they threw it back in his face and killed her. This is what a guerrilla leader does, especially when he has the powers of, well, Superman. <laughs> um, but so there, this is this and is the authority what I mean. of God. And the authority a judge of, of God. Israel. Yeah. He was a lawful judge with lawful authority. Uh, and you, so here's a place where, well, but they're in control. They're, they're unlawfully in control. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I was just thinking about this today. I was talking with someone about the great escape mm. um, and the wonderful conversation between the Nazi camp director 
mm-hmm. and the uh, commanding officer of the Allied prisoners of war, where he the the Nazi is saying, "You stop your people from trying to escape." We know that's what they do. We would like them to stop, you know. <laughs> um, and the guy says, well, it's their duty. <laughs> like, Just because you have them at gunpoint doesn't mean that their loyalty or their duty has changed. Exactly. It is their job to continue occupying as much of your energy as they can manage to help the Allied war effort. Yeah, they are still soldiers. They're still frontline soldiers. And the first, it's, it's, you, you hear it on movie, older movies all the time, the first duty of a prisoner of war. It's to escape for the reasons you just said. It's still part of the war effort. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't fit into the nice, neat, well, the government told us to, so we have to. Romans 13 has a context. It has the context of all of scripture. Mm -hmm. And and the, the, the book it's actually written in and a historical time to which he's writing. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean we're supposed to be social revolutionaries. It does mean that there's more to it than simply saying obey under all circumstances. David didn't obey Saul. He ran away. Jesus said, if they persecute you in this city, run to another one. Uh, We are not advised to, if we are private individuals, to pick up weapons and shoot at county, state, or federal officers. That's not it. But there is such a thing as simply saying no. When, um, when, When we can appeal to the apostles. When the Sanhedrin told them, don't preach in the name of Jesus, And then arrested them and threw them in prison, and the angel released them and said, go preach. They went out and preached. But but when the guards came for them, they went peaceably. They didn't start a riot. Mm -hmm. You can disobey without hurting people. You can work through lawful channels. You can enter, especially in America, you can enter lawsuits in state and federal courts. There are other options than becoming anarchists, whereby you can... can, um, oppose evil. At least for now there are. Mm -hmm. So better to take the options while we still have them than to wait till we are an occupied country. And we can't tell who's the good guys and who's the bad guys anymore. Uh, But that's, we're going to be going back to Daniel. If we haven't already covered that, we're going to cover it there for sure. (laughs) So Ezekiel, the last few chapters of Ezekiel, are apocalyptic, they're visionary. Ezekiel sees a city that in most respects seems very much like a concrete brick and board kind of city. Uh, Everywhere he turns, there's something to measure, a door, a passageway, a staircase, a wall. Uh, The angel has him going all over, measuring all kinds of things and specifying the the exact um, configuration of this, well, particularly of the temple in this new city. And it's so realistic that many commentators have believed this this would be this is a real city that will one day be rebuilt. But there's a couple problems with that. Uh, one, the si- if if you read the language carefully, and you can compare versions, translations here, some of the measurements given sound like the city and the temple are about the same size. That's a little hmm. odd. Another, which would biblically makes a lot of sense, but in mm-hmm. terms of architecture, doesn't really. <laughs> right. Uh, another is that there is a fountain that flows out of the temple, and as it goes outward toward the Dead Sea, it gets bigger and bigger as it goes, and everywhere it goes, life springs up, and there are trees, trees of life, bearing fruit all the way along the way, and the leaves are for the healing of the nations, and now... We should be remembering Revelation 21 and 22. And when the waters reach the Dead Sea, everything lives. These are, this is living water coming from the temple. All right, at this point, we should be able to say, wait, this sounds really familiar. The minor prophets mention this a lot. Zechariah particularly has a vision. But here, the water goes in one direction. Zechariah's vision, the water goes toward both seas, both the interior sea within Israel, the Dead Sea, but also to the Mediterranean, the whole Gentile world. Mm -hmm. And in Zechariah's vision, which is clearly the time of Messiah, the mountain is lifted up to great heights so the waters can flow freely to the ends of the world. So what we should see here is, yes, it's cast into the form of an architecturally correctly described city. But that's not what God's people needed to know. What they needed to know is that God has a plan for them 
for a, a place, a time, a community, a situation where there will be peace. And more than that, the peace will be peace with God. The, the book ends with this, the name of that city from that day shall be, the Lord is there, Jehovah Shammah. Mm-hmm. The Lord is there. It's the city of God. And we, we somehow lost the temple in the city of the temple of the city. Well, surprise, surprise. <laughs> you get to Revelation 21, and the city, we're told the city has no temple, for the Lamb and God are the temple thereof. The temple and city become identified. God dwells in his people. So here, is here's this prefigured the, in the restoration where the city is considered yeah, holy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is the background for the restoration uh, when they rebuild the the temple and then the city walls in Nehemiah. They sanctify it all, mm-hmm. and in fact, there's one slip where Nehemiah, he and his group are clearly standing on the city walls. He calls them the walls of the temple. Hmm. It's just a passing little remark, and it's easy to miss. If you go back and you look, you can see, wait, you're now standing in the temple of God, but you, a minute ago you were in the city wall. Wait, you're still in the city walls. What? Well, that's he understands what's going on. It is now going to be the holy city. It only been called that, I believe, once, maybe twice in all scripture, but now it is that because the whole thing has been sanctified. God's. This is where God dwells in the midst of his people. The glory cloud's gone because he now has filled them with his word and spirit so that they can become the beginnings of the glory cloud. Now, the, the, the true fulfillment comes with the ascension of Christ and the, down, mm-hmm. the outpouring of the spirit. Yeah. But this is the down payment. This is the image. This is, this is more than just an image. It's a movement in that direction as God is preparing for the evangelization of the world. And this is the, the restoration covenant is that last step in, during which Jesus comes. He comes during this, during this restoration period. Anyway. All that to say, and then when we get to the book of Revelation, we see these same images again. The, um, I won't call it paradox, because it's not, except in words, um, of Christianity is this. God is completely separate from his creation, distinct from, well, God is completely distinct from his creation, (laughs) and yet God dwells in his people. Mm -hmm. The pagan world wanted to get rid of the first and get the second. They wanted to blend those. God is so immersed in people that we are gods. That's humanism. That's Satanism. That's a you shall be as God knowing good and evil. Christianity says, no, that never happens. And yet in another way, we call it covenant. We call it the indwelling spirit. We call it the word of God written in the heart. God does condescend to dwell in his people, to be in them and with them and among them, both by his... uh, his providence and his revealed will and the power of his spirit. I remember now that there is a little thing here to read. This is from um, from John Gill, the great uh, Reformed Baptist preacher. I think this is partially my summary, partially his quotes. He says that there is a threefold way in which God gives himself to his people. And I'm just going to read what I have here. The Father gives himself to her, to the church, in Christ. He provides all things for her so that she lives and moves in the spiritual environment of total blessing and provision. The Son gives himself to her as the prophet in the midst of the church, teaching and instructing, as the high priest in the midst of the golden candlesticks, lighting and trimming them, as the king in Zion to rule and govern, protect and defend it. The Holy Spirit gives himself to her to qualify men with the gifts for ministry, to apply the word, make it useful as the spirit of grace and supplication, and to help the Lord's people in the exercise of grace and discharge of duty, and to be their comforter and remembrancer, remembrancer, to bring to their minds all that God, that Jesus has spoken. And from Matthew Henry, where the gospel is faithfully preached, gospel ordinances are duly administered, and God is worshipped in the name of Jesus Christ only. It may truly be said, the Lord is there. The Lord is there in his church to rule and to govern it, to protect and defend it, and graciously to accept and own his sincere worshipers and to be nigh unto them in all that they call upon him for. This should engage us to keep close to the communion of the saints, for the Lord is there. And then whither shall we go to better ourselves? Nay, it is true of every good Christian. He dwells in God and God in him. 
Whatever soul has in it a living principle of grace, it may truly be said, the Lord is there. And I think one of the dangers of some kinds of Calvinism is to so intellectualize and formalize the faith that it amounts to believe these things, do these practices, and you have the best Christianity. And if you're part of that, you're a Christian. And that's what it means. No, it's not <laughs> quite it. Yes, we the refer this the reformed theology represents the purest strain of Christian doctrine we have right now. Not to say you can't learn some things from some other peoples, because sometimes we get a little closed in ourselves and miss obvious connections because our own Scottish or German or Dutch presuppositions and traditions don't let us see things. And and thus there is more to the church Catholic than just that narrow stream. And yet, yeah. The Reformed faith is is pretty consistently the faith of Scripture. But subscribing to it and then arguing about it mm-hmm. is not Christianity. Yeah. It's, it's an it's important... It's not faith. It's not faith. Uh, knowledge does not save. Theological correctness does not save. Uh, and it, there's more to one's walk with God and to knowing Jesus and to have, being indwelt by the Spirit than having that kind of head knowledge and being an arrogant defender of it. Mm-hmm. The things it's that, the same thing that Sinclair Ferguson talks about mm, in the yes. whole Christ. You know, if if correctness to you is checking the boxes of mm-hmm. theological statements, you've still divorced God's desires from His person. Yeah, you've still you've made a new legalistic checklist of believing yeah. the right things. Yeah, rather than doing the right things, you believe the right things. I've I've been saying this for years, but my daughter was asking me about it the other day in a different context of why we have, why do there have to be denominations and all that? And I said, well, have you noticed, and she's kind of made the rounds of, of the three basic traditions, that if you are in the Reformed tradition, you, you're, you care about what you believe and what you know, you care about doctrine. Mm-hmm. The charismatic Pentecostal tradition, you care about what you feel and the experiences you've had. And in the um, broader evangelical Baptist uh, community, it tends to be the decisions you've made, the choices you make, and what you're busy doing and your actions. Did you and just she, profit priest and king? Oh, yeah. Right of, now? Course I, <laughs> of course I did. Um, because we all, as you well know, tend to bear the image of God with a tilt toward one of those more than another, and sometimes toward two. We're rarely well-balanced enough to have three, but some are. Which means that naturally, uh, people who are intellectual tend to be fond of Reformed churches, not without exception, but a general rule. People are very emotional, tend to be more comfortable in Pentecostal charismatic churches, and so on. Now, when the parish system existed, that was irrelevant because you went to the church that was nearest, and that was <laughs> that, and you all had to learn to get live together. The intellectuals had to live with the emotionals, had to live with the let's get stuff done around here kind of people. Mm-hmm. And it was a beautiful thing, although I'm sure it was very hard at times because, yeah. you know, throwing those three kinds of people into the same box and say, be Christians together. It's and the establishment all... church system has its problems too, as yeah, our Anglican I, friends will testify. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it does because you've got to hold their, the leader's toes to the fire on all counts. Um, but when in America, particularly, well, first of all, we splintered churches from the beginning, but particularly once we invented the automobile, Mm -hmm. now I can go to whatever church suits my taste and needs. I can even get finicky. I don't only, I not only have to, I I can go to a reformed church, broadly speaking. I can go to the reformed church that holds to my particular take on the reformed doctrine, because I can Mm -hmm. drive 20, 30, 40 miles on a Sunday if I want to. And I can go to the one that only sings psalms or that sings praise choruses. I can go to the one that's post-millennial or the one that's amillennial. I can even find a historic pre-mill church if I try hard enough and be reformed. Because I can the car- go to the one that has the best potluck lunches. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I can go to the one that has the most young people of my of the opposite gender so I can find a spouse. Mm-hmm. Which um, is not a bad reason to yeah, take into account. Yeah, none of these are necessarily bad church, reasons. Yeah. <laughs> But the thing is, we get so much, we have so much freedom to travel now that we can go find the church of our taste and we become mm-hmm. church shoppers. Now, if we would just find our church and settle down there, 
okay, we're on the right track. But now we're with people who think and value things the same way we do. And that can be a problem. Mm -hmm. The other problem, and I can speak from my own church's experience is, so we have people who are driving 20 miles from five different directions to get here. Guess how much they see each other during the week? Mm -hmm. But we have (laughs) social media. Oh, great. Let's reduce the communion of the saints to looking at a little screen. Yeah. Um, So creating the church the way Jesus envisioned is not as easy as one might think. And it's it's going to be a learning process, and technology is always going to challenge us. Harvey Cox got that right. Technology is an issue. We have to figure out what we're going to do with it. Ignoring it is not the solution. But letting it do anything it can do simply because it can is another problem. And those are discussions, I suspect, for another time. In the meanwhile, we can delight in the fact that God is in and with his people, not in the sense that the pagans thought, but in a sense, it's far more comforting because God remains God. And I don't have to be. Mm-hmm. I can trust my Savior to take care of me. Amen. That is a wonderful note to end on. So no. let's make some recommendations and head out. I believe you had one. I did. I, I was thinking about changing it because. <laughs> okay, well, you change. I'll well, pick no, it up. it's all right. It's okay. <laughs> I'm going to recommend having a cat. <laughs> Um, well, I, well, it's secondary to the true recommendation, which is have a baby. But that <laughs> seems like, I, think, I think you had that one, though. Did I? I, think I don't so. know. I, I recommended being pregnant, definitely. Okay, I that don't know if I of, ever recommended. You think that maybe the baby should come out at some time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, I try not to talk too much about this because it's very easy for me to just go on and on and on about <laughs> how how great it is. But um, we recently took in a stray cat oh. that had been hanging around our neighborhood. She had come to visit us a few times and shown herself to be very patient with little Gretchen. Mm. Oh. Just a very sweet cat. Um, so Monday night, she she moved in officially. We got our litter box and her little cat food set up. Mm. And Gretchen wakes up every day just so delighted to see this cat and she looks at the cat and she does her little dance (laughs) it's very cute um but it's just brought that extra spark of joy into our home and it's really nice to have the cat um we we don't even you know we're not we've got things to do we're not sitting around petting the cat all day just having cat cuddles (laughs) It's it's just nice to have her around and she's it's kind of like Jordan Peterson talks about with the pet a cat when you find it, because you don't know when you're going to get a cat to pet again, and it's nice. <laughs> so. Well, with Jordan Peterson recommending it, I yeah, will jump I mean... on his. I will jump on his bandwagon and, and take my recommendation as pet a cat. Now mm. we, we, my wife and I, do not own a cat. Our girls own two. <laughs> this th- th- we got them a cat when they were little. They really, really, really wanted a cat. And so when we finally moved to a house where we could have one, we got them a cat. And for a long time, the cat was just the center of everything. But they got tired of that cat, and that cat got kind of old and grumpy. And then there's a long story we will skip through. They, my oldest daughter finally got her own cat. Her own cat is noisy. I, well, the one rule <laughs> I, I laid down was, it can't be a Siamese. Okay, Dad. Okay, half Siamese, what's included in that? (laughs) And so she, her name is Lucy. She does cry a lot. And she doesn't always do what you want. She doesn't know how to be a very good cat. (laughs) That's how it goes with Siamese, right? (laughs) Yeah, but lately I have been learning how to just, okay, she's on the bed. She's being annoying. I simply push her down, hold her there and pet her. And then she succumbs and starts purring. (laughs) <laughs> there is something about that. I, I'm a dog person. Dogs just come up and want to be petted and they 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 know what they're supposed to do. Cats don't. But next to petting a dog, petting a cat <laughs> relieves a lot of tension and having a cat in the house, this other living creature that's not human. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> that just wanders around and does its own thing. Uh, Lucy has this habit of pawing at things just to see what will happen when they fall. 
And so <laughs> we're in our bedroom at night. We hear a crash. Like, okay, that was the cat. Do we find out and clean up about it? Clean it up now or wait till, let's wait till the morning. Okay, whatever. <laughs> um, you know, it's there. They are beyond our control. They don't, dogs are trainable. Cats, not so much. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting element to liven up things and to bring the a whole idea of the Dominion Mandate a little closer. The original mm -hmm. Dominion Mandate started with taking care of animals, having, yes, oxen in the field and horses in the barn, but also dogs and cats and whatever else that you want mm -hmm. to domesticate in your house in close contact. And it's a little like Eden when... Um, the child will play on the cockatrice's den. Well, cats aren't that bad. They do scratch you <laughs> occasionally and bite you, <clears throat> Lucy. But um, yeah, it's pet petting a cat is a good thing. And if you're not a cat person, there's always dogs mm -hmm. and other such things. Yeah. So I laughed when you said living creature because I was yeah. on the phone with my friend Virginia today mm -hmm. and she was like, tell me about this cat. And I was telling her about how much we like it and how much Gretchen likes it. And also that it's kind of nice to have something else that Gretchen can obsess about because otherwise it's just mom, right? And I get nothing right. done. <laughs> right. And, and Virginia used that word living creature specifically with reference to like Ezekiel. It's, yeah. like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a weird thing, you know? And mm. then you think about how, you know, they're called living creatures, which is kind of weird. And then... But then you read the description of them and it's like, well, what else are you going to call them? They're, mm -hmm. they're just sort of living creatures, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I, I had to laugh and when it's, you and, used and that it's, specific phrase. Well, and it's good to bring that, the recommendation back to scripture. I mentioned the dominion mandate, mm -hmm. but the living creatures as they appear in Ezekiel seem to symbolize God's presence and angelic presence in all living creatures. Mm -hmm. So again, this is far removed from the secular view that would treat them simply as a mass of moving molecules that we can use however we want. They have a place in God's creation. That place was ordained with respect to us. We we have we're made to have relationships with these things, and not just mm -hmm. as food items. Um, yeah, we're supposed I, the, to. The phrase I've tried to use with my students when we talked about the Dominion Mandate was taking care of. Yes. Rather than using, yes, which very good is what I liked about Paddington. But I know we disagree <laughs> about Paddington, so we'll have to talk about that sometime on the air. Yeah, the the film, not the book. We all love right. the book. Yeah, books. Yeah, okay. you, everybody loves Paddington the book. Yes, unless they're you know a Nazi yeah. or something. <laughs> on that note, on that. <laughs> thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thank you also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to send us an email, you can do so at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Big thank you to our financial supporters. Thanks for keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion or patreon.com slash haltingtowardszion. You can follow us or subscribe to us, I guess is the correct term, on Substack. That is where you get our episodes delivered straight to your inbox. You don't have to go anywhere. It's all just right there. And that is also the way to get our transcripts. If you prefer to read the show, subscribe to our Substack. You can follow us on YouTube, Facebook. We don't. Do we do Facebook? I don't know. I don't think we do Facebook anymore. But yeah, we're, we have a page. You can like it if you want. It just doesn't do much. Um, you can follow us on Goodreads, as always. Thank you and good night. <laughs>